welcome and greetings from Mobileye. Mobileye is what I call the poster child of the startup nation. And the first question that I want you to think about is how is Israel known as the startup nation? How is it that this teeny tiny country has the most IPOs, the most patents, the most startups in the world? Of course, that's per capita, but even in absolute numbers, Israel is just behind the United States and China. That doesn't make a lot of sense for a little country that's got the population the size of New York City. So everybody's asking this question, how is Israel this powerhouse of innovation? So much so that they wrote a book about us. It's called The Startup Nation. Um, it goes through chapter by chapter to try to answer this question. Um, there's a chapter on the Israeli army. Young guys go to the army and they learn self-sacrifice, self-discipline, all kinds of skills, and they take that with them to the working world. Um, there's a chapter on Israeli society. Israeli society is very close and small, and everybody knows everybody, so you can get money and ideas moving around. Um, there's no hierarchy, so low-level engineers can talk to high-level management, and you'll hear about that in the Mobileye story. There's a lot of really interesting chapters in this book, um, which I highly recommend that you read. However, I think in the middle of this book, there's one sentence that says it all. Con todos sus problemas, Israel tiene un gran ventaja, sentido de propósito. A sense of purpose. So I want you to put this idea of propósito in the back of your mind as we go through this lecture. Um, and allow me to introduce myself. So my name is Moise Navon. I'm one of the founding engineers of Mobileye. I designed this chip. This is the chip that's powering the autonomous vehicle revolution. This is the chip that Intel paid $15.3 billion. That's the largest exit in Israeli history. That's the second largest purchase that Intel ever made in its history. And the question that you need to ask yourself now is por qué? Why would the largest chip manufacturer in the world, they know how to make chips. They make thousands of chips in thousands of industries. Why would they come to a little pipsqueak company in Israel that makes one chip? That's all we do. And pay that kind of money. So. What does that mean, that kind of money? 15.3 billion is a big number, but if you're selling 15.3 billion tables for a dollar each, that's a lot of tables. It's not a lot of money. So how do you value a company? I understand that you guys are in business. You understand there's a way to value companies. You'll humor me as I explain to you just the simple way. So the simple way to get a quick idea if a company is expensive or cheap is called the PE the price per earnings, um, you know that basically the 500 largest companies on the New York Stock Exchange, the S&P 500, go for an average PE of 16. That means that people are willing to pay 16 times the current earnings of a company. Why would you pay 16 times Why? what the company is making? Because you know that next year more people will be born and so more people will buy the product if we're talking about Coca-Cola that this example is. So more babies will be born and more people will drink Coke and the earnings will go up and that's how people make money on the stock market. Um, if you're a tech company, so people spec expect a lot more from you than just babies drinking Coke. Um, they think that you're going to change the world. You're going to bring technology that's going to change everything. And so they expect that your earnings growth will go up exponentially in the near future. And so people are willing to pay much more than 16 times your current earnings. They're willing to pay 30 times, 50 times, 60 times. When you start getting into numbers like that, so you're getting into more risk. You're saying, I believe that in the near future, this company's earnings are going to go up 50 times. So anyway, now that we understand this little piece of finance, we know the P. The P was $15.3 billion. We don't know the E. How much more than we were making was Intel willing to pay for us? 16 times more, 50 times more, 
a hundred times more. So it turns out that Intel paid a PE of 130. That's a pretty significant premium. But then you guys are business people, so you know people don't really buy companies based on a PE. There's another really good metric, which is called future cash flows. How much is this company going to make in the future? What contracts do they have lined up, et cetera? So Intel knew that the autonomous vehicle market is going to be huge. The future cash flows are going to be huge. And so they're willing to pay a pretty penny for the company that's going to get them to that market. But that's not the why that I'm asking you. The why that I'm asking you is why didn't Intel do it themselves? Why don't they make their own chip to access those future cash flows? Why did they come to Mobileye to do that? So that's basically the question that I want to answer for you in this talk. And I want to give the answer basically in context. The context is that I would like to explain to you how did I get here. And then I will explain to you how did Mobileye get here. Then I will explain to you how the startup nation got here. Because if you listen to my story closely, my story is the mobilized story. It's the story of the startup nation. So as you can tell, I wasn't born in Israel. Um, I was born in Los Angeles. I grew up what's called a secular Jew. That means I wasn't religious. Um, I had a nice life. I grew up surfing and skateboarding. This is me in the 1980s. Um, I had a good life. but when I was about seven or eight years old, I found out that people die. So I said to myself, what's the point? Qualo es mi propósito? Why are we here? Um, it didn't take me long growing up in Los Angeles to get onto the Greek and Roman answer, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But then, I thought about this question a little bit more. And I said, you know, when you're gone, you are so gone that you don't even know you ever existed. So what's the point of eat, drink, and be merry? So my parents weren't particularly religious. They weren't existentialist philosophers. Uh, so I went surfing. I surfed my whole youth. I was on the surf team at UCLA when I was studying computer engineering. And it was there in my second year uh, studying computer engineering that I got a student internship at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So you can imagine um, for an engineering student to get an internship at JPL is pretty great. So I was really excited. I remember the first day I got there, um, I met the boss. He explained to me the engineering. He gave me a tour of the campus. I think it's about the size of Antigua. Um, anyway, so that basically took us to lunchtime. We went to the cafeteria, and he said, order whatever you want. So I smelled the hamburgers. I said, I'll have a cheeseburger. So my boss, he made a face. I said, the cheeseburgers here aren't good. I'll get something else. Made another face. So I said, uh, I don't read faces. So if you don't tell me the cheeseburgers aren't good, I'm going to get what I like. I think that was the last cheeseburger I ever ate. Turns out that my boss at JPL was a religious Jew. And in religious Judaism, so it's a big no-no to eat milk and meat together. So basically, for the next two years of this student internship, half the day we talked engineering. And half the day, we talk Jewish philosophy. Um, in a nutshell, he said, really very simple, we believe there's a creator. We believe you have a soul. We believe there's a purpose. Ay creador, ay alma, ay propósito. You're here to fix yourself. You're here to fix the world. So these ideas began to resonate with me. I started trying to think. I said, yeah. I need to do more purposeful things. The problem was that at the time, I was the rush chairman of a fraternity. That's me in the circle. You guys know about fraternities? I don't know if you have them in universities here, but they're basically like the movies. Party, party, party. 
Um, the rush chairman is in charge of the parties at the beginning of the year. There are other chairmen that do the parties in the middle of the year. Anyway, we had this big party, and we had all these pizzas, and I had this pepperoni pizza in my hand. And I said, oh, my boss at JPL said we don't eat milk and meat together. So I took the pepperonis off. Um, for those of you who know anything about Jewish law, this doesn't help at all. You can't cook the stuff together. Anyway, it was a good start. Um, to cut to the chase, while I was at Mobileye for 16 years, so six of those years, I went to a yeshiva in Jerusalem. It's, called, it's basically a seminary where you learn how to be a rabbi. So I'm also a rabbi, and I'm also an engineer. Um, but to go back to the story, so at the time I was at UCLA, I was going out with a girl who later became my wife. Um, and she was from the same background, and we sort of grew into our Judaism together. And we decided, we said, you know, if we're going to do this Jewish thing, we need to go to the land of the Jews. We need to move to Israel. So I sent my resume to all kinds of American engineering firms that had operations in Israel. I was lucky to get a no thank you letter. Nobody's hiring anybody from 12,000 kilometers away. So my wife said, you know, why don't you go? You'll make a pilot trip. You'll fly there. You'll interview. And then we'll move. I said, ah, that's a lot of money. I have to fly there. I have to take two weeks off of work. I don't think that's going to work. So she said, let's just go. So I said, uh, without a job? And she said, yeah, yeah, people, they do that. I said, I don't know those people. I'm not going without a job. Um, right about that time, so I was working for an engineering company in LA. There was a bunch of Israelis that were on sabbatical leave. They took a year off to go work out of the country. So I made friends with them. And one of them one morning came and put this fax on my desk. It was a fax from IBM Israel. IBM Israel is coming to Los Angeles to interview for these 9, 10 computer positions. So I said, wow, I could do at least half of these, but why did you give me? I don't, I mean, you don't tell people you're thinking about leaving where you're working. At least you shouldn't, right? Anyway, so um, I said, why did you give me? He said, oh, I thought you'd be interested. I said, yeah, I'm interested. So I faxed my resume to IBM Israel. They set up uh, an interview with the CEO of IBM Israel. I met this guy named Yosef Raviv in the Beverly Hills Hilton. Yosef Raviv is one of the founders of the startup nation. He's the guy who brought IBM to the Technion University campus um, in Israel in the 1970s. That's before anybody used the word start or up in the same sentence. Uh, anyway, so I met him, it was very nice. He said, listen, you seem like a nice guy. Your resume looks good, but you need a technical interview. I can't give you a technical interview. But the head of the chip design group is going to be in the San Francisco airport next week. Can you meet him in the San Francisco airport? I said, easier to fly to San Francisco than it is to fly to Israel. So the next week, I met a guy by the name of Aaron Aaron um, in the VIP lounge of the San Francisco airport. Aaron Aaron is also a big name in the startup nation. He was the first CEO of Apple Israel. He was the head of the Israel Innovation Authority. At the time, he was the head of the chip design group at IBM. Anyway, so it sounds very cool, um, but it wasn't. You see, Aaron Aaron was also the head of the computer science department at the Technion University. And his idea of an interview is asking finals questions. So he's asking me end of the year test questions for a course I didn't take. So to make a long story short, I failed. He said, thank you very much. I folded up my stuff and I left. When I got to the door of this VIP lounge, I said, oh my God, you just blew your chance to get to Israel. I can't let this happen. I turned around, I went back to Aaron Aaron. He's still sitting on the couch in this VIP lounge, and I said, listen, you know what I don't know, but you don't know what I do know. I've been working in this industry for close to 10 years. I've done all kinds of interesting designs. I designed the Star Wars system. You guys know about Star Wars? Not the movie. So um, 
In the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, uh, Ronald Reagan, the president of the United States, was very concerned that Russia was going to shoot ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, at the United States. And so he developed what's called the Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise known as Star Wars. We developed missiles to take out Russian missiles in space. Now, did you ever think, how do you test such a system? So the easiest thing to do is to shoot up two missiles and see if they hit. But what if they don't? Not pretty. So um, you have to figure out a way to test these things before you go shooting them up in space. I was tasked with designing what's called the IRSP. It's an infrared scene projector. Basically, it's a missile simulator. We make a movie screen of Russian missiles flying by. You take the American camera that's going to go on the head end of the American missile, and you put it in front of the movie player, and you see how it follows. OK, you see how it can track other missiles. Basically, it's a movie player that plays missiles. The thing is that it's, these are heat-seeking missiles. So you need to play the movie in heat, which means you need a room like this big full of laser beams that paint the movie of missiles going by. Anyway, it's a complicated system. I explained to him. He said, thank you very much. I folded up my stuff, and I left. About a week later, I got a phone call from Yosef Raviv, the CEO of IBM Israel. He said, we want to give you a job. So I went to my wife, and I said, I have good news, and I have bad news. The good news is we got the job. The bad news is they want to pay us half of what we're making. So my wife said, fine. I said, what do you mean, fine? We're not exactly rich in LA. How are we going to make it on half of our salary? She said, they're making it, we'll make it. Not so easy. Did you ever have to cut your budget in half? So if you Google tips on budgeting, you will get stop drinking coffee out. Thank you very much. We're, we're way past coffee out. I had a car of my own since I was 16 years old. If you don't have a car in LA, you don't exist in LA. But now I can't afford a car. I'm hitchhiking to work. But remember, we said Israel's a small country. So who stops to pick me up on my first day to work? Yosef Raviv, the CEO of IBM Israel, stops in his Rolls Royce. OK, in 1992, there were no Rolls Royces in Israel. It was a Volvo. But a Volvo in 1992 was like a Rolls Royce in, his, in LA. Anyway, um, it was a good start. Haifa is a really nice place. IBM is a really um, great place to learn how to design chips. I, I really I learned how to design chips working there. But socially, Haifa was a nightmare. Because there's no Americans, there's no English speakers, there's no religious people. We didn't have friends. Um, after about a year, I said, I can't take it anymore. I have to find something else. Um, and right about that time, so a friend of mine had a startup in Jerusalem. So I said, oh, Jerusalem, English speakers, religious people, we'll go there. So when they threw this uh, going away party for me at IBM, they said, so what is this startup you're going to do? What do they do? And I told them, and they said, you're leaving IBM for that? That's a really dumb idea. And they were right. The startup went under in like three months, and I was on the street. But at least I was on the street in Jerusalem. Um, I began to look for work. After a couple of weeks, I found another startup in Herzliya Pituach. Herzliya Pituach is like the R&D center just north of Tel Aviv. Um, I worked for a company called OptiBase. They were making MPEG systems. MPEG is the algorithm that compresses and decompresses video. It's what allows you to watch videos on your phone. If there was an MPEG, um, you would have to carry around, I don't know, a box this big full of all your movies just to be able to see what you have on your phone. Anyway, I'm talking about the year 1994. This is the very beginning of MPEG systems. I was tasked with designing the first video on demand system for airplanes. If you guys watch movies when you fly, you watch it on my system. In 1994, if you wanted to watch a movie, um, you had to wait for the stewardess to put a cassette in and you watched what she wanted, when she wanted, and if there was turbulence, so then you didn't watch. Um, 
Anyway, uh, it was a great job. I learned a lot. Um, but driving from Jerusalem to Herzliya Pituach every day is a nightmare. Um, basically, my life was drive, eat, work, sleep, drive, eat, work, sleep. I had no life. So I said, I need to find something else. Right about that time, um, a friend of mine was working at a place called NDS. He said, come and work for us. NDS is News Digital Systems. It's the technology arm of the News Corporation. Rupert Murdoch has many television stations and television corporations and like Fox TV and B Sky B. And he wants to make sure that people pay for their TV. So I designed this chip, which is basically an encryption decryption chip. It scrambles the video before it goes out over the cable or over the satellite. If you have my chip on your television, it descrambles it and you watch TV. Um, it was a great job. Before I left the video on demand company, so a friend of mine said, did you buy your options? So you guys know about options. Basically, engineers get to go to a company and if the company is not public yet, so they get their salary and you get options. Options are shares in the company that if the company goes public, they'll convert to stock and you can sell them on the stock market. The company is not your friend, they're your employer. So they want you to feel like you have a piece of the company, they give you some shares, and as long as you stay with the company, they're yours. But if you leave the company, so you have to give the options back, or you can buy them, right? And so that means you have to put out money for something that may be worth zero. So I told my friend, I said, I don't have money for these options. So he looked at me and he said, are you crazy? We're engineers. Engineers are not going to make it financially on their salary. It's the options. You don't leave options on the table. So I said, you know, it sounds like good advice, um, but I can't take this drive anymore, and I don't have the money, so I'm out of here. I went to go work for NDS from 1995 to the year 2000. If you guys remember, the year 2000 was the year that everybody figured out that the internet is the next big thing. Um, this is a stock market chart of the NASDAQ during what was called the dot-com boom. So from 1980 to 1990 to 1999, the stock market didn't really do much. All of a sudden, it took off. That's the world realizing that the next big thing is the internet. And so basically every little company space in every little bit of office space all over Israel was another internet company. And that's when I said to myself, this is my chance. I'm going to go put my friend's piece of advice to work. I'm going to go to a startup. I'm going to get some options. And so um, I left NDS and I went to go work for a company called OnePath. They were making fiber to the home systems. Everybody knows what fiber to the home is today. I'm talking about the year 2000. That's when we were just trying to build out the very first fiber to the home systems in the world. Um, they gave me my salary. They gave me my options, and they said, don't worry, we have funding for one year. But next year, we'll go to the NASDAQ, we'll get more money, and we'll keep developing. But for those of you who know the history of the dot-com boom, there was no next year. The dot-com boom became the dot-com bust. Um, if we talked about PEs in the 16s, 30s, 50s, 100s, these are PEs in the thousands. And so even though people don't really use PEs, they actually really do. And so um, the guys on Wall Street said, two guys in a garage are writing a website, have a PE of 1,000? That doesn't make sense. And they sold, and everybody sold, and the market was cut in half within a year. Um, this is really interesting for business people, finance people, investment people. This is not interesting to live through. You see, when this happens, economies crash, companies go under, and people are out of work. And that's what happened to me. The company One Path went under, and I was on the street again. But now, this isn't just being on the street, right? This is now the bottom of my career. I'm on the street. 
All my engineering friends are on the street. All of the engineering jobs we would have gone to are gone. The little companies have folded. The big companies are streamlining. Now what do I do? So that's when I had to put into play a little piece of Jewish philosophy. This is a page of the Talmud. The Talmud is a giant encyclopedia of Jewish law and philosophy. There's all kinds of stories. This page has a story about a guy named Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was one of the great teachers of Israel. Um, he was very wise, but he also had a very difficult life. But even with his difficult life, he was able to get through all of his troubles because he had one very simple piece of philosophy that's called Gam Zu Letova. Esta es para la bien tambien. This is also for the best. Gam Zu Letova basically means I don't know what's going on. This bad thing happened, but I'm not going to let it get me stuck. Okay, Rabbi Akiva was not a prophet. He didn't know that some good thing is going to happen from this. He just believed that he's a tiny piece of a puzzle of something much bigger, and he's not going to let difficulties stop him. Gam Zula Tova is about picking up the pieces and keep moving. Um, it's a really great piece of philosophy to talk about. It's not an easy piece of philosophy to live by. You need to teach yourself. You need to start with little things. You're at the beach and you're walking and you stub your toe. Ow, ow, ow. Gam Zula Tova. And you move on. If you get really good at that so that when you leave school or work and you come to your car and there's a $200 parking ticket on your windshield and you look at it and you say, Gam Zula Tova. And you get in your car and you move on. Um, if you get really good at that, so then when you're out of work and all your friends are out of work and you have five kids, a wife, and a mortgage to take care of, you start sending your resume out. So I began to look for work. It wasn't easy. It took several weeks. Um, finally, I got an offer from a big company in Tel Aviv. And I said, big company, no options. I still didn't give up on my dream to work for a startup and get some options, I'm not going to take it. I kept looking and kept talking to people, telling people I'm looking for a startup. Um, after a couple of weeks, I had an offer from a startup, but they wanted me to design an internet chip. I said, internet, no more internet for me. So I kept looking, kept talking. Finally, I met some guy, and he said, you know, you used to work for a guy at NDS. He's working for a startup in a little house just outside of Jerusalem. So I'd start up. I'm looking for a startup, but what do they do? Internet? He said, no, no. Something in automotive. I said, cars. People need cars. I'll go work for them. So in case you didn't guess, that little car startup was bought out by Intel for the largest exit in Israeli history. So Gamzu Litova. You guys learn Hebrew fast. So anyway, that brings us to the Mobileye story. So um, Mobileye was started by a guy named Amnon Shashua about a year or so before I got there. Amnon Shashua is the head of the computer science department at Hebrew University. At the time, he was doing what professors do, research, papers, lectures. He happened to be in the Far East giving a lecture on his recent research. And in the lecture, so he said, you know, we can detect objects with a single camera. So somebody in the back of the room said, excuse me, excuse me, do you mean 3D objects in 3D space with a single camera? And Amun said, yeah, yeah, and he moved on with his lecture. When he came off the stage, he was surrounded by a team of engineers from Toyota, and they said, are you kidding? We've been working on this problem for years. And we've been working under the paradigm, two eyes, two cameras. You can't see depth with one eye. If you close one eye, everything goes flat, but not really. So do you need two eyes or you don't need two eyes? So this piece of physiology became apparent to me a few years ago. I was at the Boston Science Museum, um, and they had this display, a glass box, like an aquarium, without fish. Inside the box are objects that you see every day. I don't know, a cup, 
a pencil, a yo-yo, everyday stuff, and you're like, why is this in the museum? So you go around to the side of this box, and there's a black plate with a little peephole like you have on your door. You look through the peephole, and you see those objects flat like a poster, no depth. What happened? So the answer is context. When I close one eye and I look at you, so I know what people look like, I know what chairs look like, I know what rooms look like. So when I close my eyes, I can guess. And between what I know, people, chairs, rooms, and what I don't know, the exact distance, my brain can make a really good guess. And at the end of the day, you only need one eye. So why do we have two eyes? Because for anything closer than arm's length, you can't guess. If I have to guess where this is, I can't do it. You have to have two eyes for close. But anything over a car bumper, you can guess really well. So Amnon said, what we do in our brain, we can do in our computers. The engineers at Toyota said, we don't believe you, but here's $100,000, prove it. So Amnon took the money, came back to Jerusalem. He got a couple of PhD students. He got a couple of engineering helpers. He got a box load of computers, put them in the back of a van, hooked them up to a camera looking out the front windshield, and he proved it. You can detect 3D objects in 3D space with a single camera. That's huge. That is the novelty that basically founded Mobileye. Um, no one thought it could be done. There are many business implications to this, not only that you don't need two cameras. If you have two cameras and one of them gets bumped, your system doesn't work. The amount of computing power that you need to integrate two videos is like 10 times the, what to deal with one. Anyway, um, he proved it, but he proved it academically. The, the system worked at like nine frames a second. Nine frames a second, being able to analyze nine pictures in one second is not fast enough to do anything in real time. By the time that system says breaks, you just ran over 10 people. So that's when he hired my friend and myself and a couple of other engineers. He stuck us in this attic in this little house just outside of Jerusalem. And we took all the algorithms, and we took all the software, and we took all the hardware, and we put it in this chip that works at the speed of your eye, 30 frames a second. So now you can do something with this, but what is it? What's the application? What do you do with this super duper image processor that detects 3D objects in 3D space with a single camera at the speed of your eye. So you guys know the end of the story, autonomous vehicles. But in the year 2000, 2001, 2002, nobody was talking about autonomous vehicles. When I was hired by the CEO of Mobileye, so he said, we're making ACC, Adaptive Cruise Control. Cruise Control, you push the button, you go 90, you get to traffic, you put on your brakes. Adaptive cruise control says, we see the traffic, we see the car in front of you, we will adjust your speed, the car moves away in front of you, we put you back to what you want. In the year 2000, um, adaptive cruise control systems were available on very expensive luxury cars because at that time, radar cost a few thousand dollars. And radar's really good at detecting distance, but it was too expensive for most cars. Um, it was in the Jaguar that we had in our garage that we were mimicking. So Mobileye said, we don't need radar. We can take a cheap camera and our cheap chip, and we will sell ACC for $100. ACC for the masses will be in every car. So um, that's what Mobileye was found to do. The CEO gave me my salary, or I should say he cut my salary. This is a startup. Um, he gave me my options, and he said, don't worry. We're going to have an exit in two years. Now, either he was naive, or I was naive, or the both of us were, but it takes a year at least to design the logic inside this chip. It takes a year to synthesize it, a year to put it in silicon, a year to test the silicon, a year to go in a car. You're looking at five to six years before you're putting on the brakes of a commercial vehicle. But we didn't know that. So off to work we went, and one year became two, two became three, three became four, and then the CEO came to us and said, quedamos sin dinero. 
We need to sell this chip today. We can't wait to be in cars. We need some other application. What can we do with this thing? So we all began to brainstorm. What can we do? What application? At the end of the day, we came up with this idea called the aftermarket product. Basically, it's a box that sits on your front windshield. There's a camera here looking out. My chip is inside the box. It analyzes the scene, sends the signals over a cable to, your front, to a display on your dashboard. And basically, 2.5 means you have 2.5 seconds before you crash into the car in front of you. It tells you the amount of time you have to react. Um, if you get too close, it beeps you. If you leave your lane without signaling, it beeps you. It's a warning system. Mobileye is not interested in this at all. We don't advertise, we don't do any marketing, any sales. We hired a couple guys on commission. We just need a little bit of money so that we can get into cars. But there are other companies that are very interested in this system. Insurance companies want to know if it's, they can stop accidents and they can pay out less. Safety companies working for the government want to know if they can reduce accidents in the country. So all of these companies started analyzing if our system was helping drivers. And I'll never forget the night when the CEO told us the results of all these tests. Um, this is the CEO, Ziv Aviram, um, who took the company public with Amnon Shashua. Uh, you know how companies work. They want to make you feel like a family. So they have a company dinner every year. They invite you. Um, if they have money, they invite your spouse. If not, so not. Um, they give you some nice food. They give you some nice entertainment. And then the CEO, he gets up and he gives his CEO speech. You know how the CEO speech goes? I will tell you. We're doing well. Work harder. We'll do better. It usually takes CEOs 20 to 30 minutes to say these three sentences. Um, in any case, uh, this particular evening, the CEO, he, he didn't have his CEO face on. He didn't have his CEO speech on. He was really serious, and he looked out at everybody, and he said, you know what, guys? We're saving lives. And everybody said, what? What do you mean saving lives? ACC for the masses, a luxury toy. So it turns out that all of these tests that were being done with people driving with our systems showed that people driving with our system were not getting into accidents. And if they did get into an accident, it turned what would have been a fatal crash into a fender bender. And so all of a sudden, Mobileye changed directions. And we stopped being a toy company, and we started being a safety company. And we realized that, you know, if we can beat people um, to stop because they're going to crash, we can put on the brakes. And we'll call it AEB, Automatic Emergence Braking. And if we can beat people because they're leaving their lane when they don't want to, we'll call it LKA, Lane Keeping Assist. And all of a sudden, there's a whole group of applications that falls under this industry called ADIS, Advanced Driving Assistance Systems. And Advanced Driving Assistance Systems basically means any computer help to make the car drive safer, better. Um, and their governments are giving safety points for any car that has any one of these features. And insurance companies are giving discounts for any car that has any one of these features. And there's only one company in the entire world that has all the ADIS features in one chip. And so Mobileye today owns 70% of the worldwide um, ADIS market. We're in over 170 million cars around the world. Um, and that brings us to the second pivot. So a couple of the engineers were working on the system, and they said, you know, we're controlling the brakes. We're controlling the gas. We're controlling the steering. We're controlling the car. Let's make an autonomous vehicle. So they took their story upstairs to the CEO. They said they told him what they wanted to do. I can tell you if this was in LA or anywhere else, so the CEO would have said, we have no customers for autonomous vehicles. Go back to work. But this isn't just anywhere. This is the startup nation. And so the CEO said, you know, that's an interesting research project. Take this Audi and go play in the garage. So these two engineers got a couple of helpers. They took three of these chips, put them on a board, connected them to eight 
cameras surrounding the car. And within a year, they had the world's, world's first camera-only autonomous vehicle. So I stay camera only because you guys know that Google has been working on this. Many other car companies have been working on autonomous vehicles before us. But they're all working using a system called LiDAR. LiDAR is that big spinning imaging system that's on the top of the Google cars. Um, it's really good at making 360 degree images, but it's really expensive, especially at the time when they were first working on it. It cost just for the sensor $100,000. Mobileye was able to get this car to drive from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea, hands-free, for $2,000. So that's commercially viable. Um, of course, there's a lot more development to make it safe, etc. But at the end of the day, we built a cheap platform to drive a car by itself. But we still have no customers for autonomous vehicles. But we do have ADIS customers. So Tesla came and said, what's that? We want it. And Audi and Nissan and VW and just about every car company that you can think of said, we want it. Every car company but Toyota. So if you remember Toyota, they gave us the first money. But then they said, oh, you proved it. Bye bye. We're Japanese. We work with the Japanese. They went to NEC. NEC is like the Intel of Japan. Now, you can't blame the Japanese. Everybody works with their own. The Jews work with the Jews, and the Americans with the Americans. Nobody's blaming Japan for doing their, what's good for them. But was it really good for them? You see, NEC, they're smart engineers. They know how to design chips, but they don't know how to design this chip. You see, we had been working on this already for 10 years. Um, I never forget, at every company dinner, the CEO would also tell us that we are the largest group on the face of the earth working on this one pro problem. It didn't matter when we were 10 people or 110 people. There was no other company that had algorithms people, software people, and hardware people all under the same roof working on one problem how to detect 3D objects in 3D space with a single camera. So I'll never forget the day they told us that Toyota drove their car off the lot with the NEC chip. It burned up the minute they left the parking lot. What happened? So to understand what happened, I have to give you a little lesson in computer engineering. So this is the architecture of a basic computer chip. It has memory, that's where you have your movies. It has a player, a, a control logic that plays your movies. It has a math unit that does the compression and decompression. It has a screen, it has a um, keyboard input. That's a computer. You can describe just about any computer using this what's called von Neumann basic structure, okay? That's not what we did in this chip, okay? So now to understand the difference, um, so one of the blocks that I was responsible for designing is called the tracker. The tracker has to follow the car around the road. It tracks cars frame by frame, image by image. Now, a person does this visually. You look at the car, you see the car, and you keep your distance. But there are no pictures inside chips. There are pixels, dots of, picture, dots of color that make up the picture. But color is very computation intensive. It takes a lot of computers to deal with. So we use black and white. Black and white's much easier, but then again, there's no black and white inside computers. There are numbers, okay? If you have um, what's called eight bits, you can describe 256 numbers. So now we say white is zero, black is 255. All the grays in between are all the numbers in between. OK, so now we can describe this Ferrari going around the, the, the mountain with math, with numbers. We convert the visual problem into a math problem. So how do I make sure that this frame and this frame have the same car? I need to compare the two images. What I do is I take the pixel number one from this image and pixel number one from the other image, and I subtract them if they're the same, so I get zero. I go to the next pixel and I subtract them, I add the number, I go through all the pixels in the image, at the end I get one number. If it's zero, the images are identical. If it's 10, I'm probably still okay. If it's a big number, 
I lost the card. Okay, so now how do you do that in a standard computer? So if I'm, let's say I'm the control unit, okay? So it's a little hard with one and a half hands, but let's try. So I say, Mr. Memory number one, give me pixel number one. Mr. Memory number two, give me pixel number one. Mr. Math unit, subtract. Mr. Memory number one, give me pixel number two. Pick what? Get the idea. Subtract, add, subtract, add. If you do this for thousands of pixels at 30 frames a second, you're going to start sweating. If you're a chip, you're going to burn up. So you need to figure out how to do this more efficiently. So I didn't use a general processor. I designed a block just to compare two images. I bring a row of pixels, not one at a time, and a row of pixels. And here I have a row of subtractors and an adder. And while I just did that math, I already got the other pixels. I'm working super fast, super efficiently in what's called pipeline fashion. And that's why this chip can work sitting on your windshield in the summertime, in the desert, without a fan, and not burn up. And so that's why um, in 2008, we got the award for the best electronic design in the automotive industry. And that's probably why, or at least one of the reasons why Intel came to us. So in 2014, we, dis we declared a partnership. These are the CEOs of Intel, BMW, and Mobileye. We said, we are going to bring an autonomous vehicle commercially available. And Mobileye was really happy because this is our first big contract. But Intel is not happy because Intel said, who are our partners here? Well, there's BMW. What do they do? The metal and the rubber? We can't do that. And who are these people? Mobileye? What do they do? They make a chip? We make chips. As a matter of fact, the whole board controlling the car is Intel. All the chips on the board, Intel. There's only one chip in the system that's not Intel. What do you think they want to do to us? They want to get rid of us. Every day they came to Mobileye, they said, oh, how does this work? And oh, how does this interface work? And basically they tried to figure out what we're doing so that they could do it. But then something amazing happened and the CEO of Intel came to Jerusalem. He gathered all the employees in the Jerusalem theater, and he said, and I quote, we've been watching you for months, and we decided it's better to buy you than to beat you. And so that was the exit. Um, like I said, it was the largest exit in Israeli history. It was so many dollars that came into the country that it, it, it changed the exchange rate between dollars and shekels. Um, but it wasn't just about the money. Um, what happened was what I call a paradigm shift, a change in the way the world looks at Israel. The CEO of Intel, when he announced the buyout, he got on international television and he said, you know, Intel is just as much an Israeli company as it is a American company. But why would you say that? First of all, it's not true. Intel is an American company that has a lot of operations in Israel. It's not an Israeli company. But even if it was true, do you know that Mobileye never declared itself an Israeli company? We are incorporated in the Netherlands, and we have an R&D facility in Jerusalem. People don't want to do business with Israel. It's not good for business, so why declare it? But all of a sudden, it is good to do business with Israel. All of a sudden, the CEO of the largest chip manufacturer in the world says, I'm Israeli. And so if that's not enough to convince you, the CEO of the largest VC company in Israel, the John Medved, who's in charge of a company called Our Crowd, um, went on the press and said, ever since the Intel Mobileye buyout, my phone has not stopped ringing from all over the world. And they're all saying one thing, we want a piece of this, take our money. And so basically since the Mobileye Intel buyout till today, groups have been coming from all over the world to learn about Israeli technology, to learn about Israeli innovation. And that's why I've been giving these talks 
ever since that buyout. I've been giving these talks because I want people to know what Israel is about. I want people to know that we have a proposito. Our purpose is to make the world a better place. As I said, we're supposed to fix ourselves. We're supposed to fix the world. That is the proposito of Israel, of the Jewish people. We have been trying to do that throughout history, and that is what Israel as a nation today is doing. We are the purveyors of science and technology, medicine and industry in the world. And so that's what I want people to know. I also want people to know that technology, as great as it is, also needs to be framed by ethics. And that's why I teach a course on ethics in artificial intelligence to engineers at Ben Gurion University. Um, but at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. We want to make the world a better place. Most people understand that. Some people are trying to stop us, but we will not be stopped. We will continue to try to help the world be a better place. I've given this talk to just about any group that will listen. I've given this talk to UN delegates. I've given this talk to United States senators, to Chile senators, to politicians from Spain, from just about every country you can think of. I've given it to MBA programs from everywhere, from Hong Kong to London to the United States to all of Latin America. I just came back on a trip from Colombia, Panama, and Peru. Um, I'm trying to get this message across because I want people to understand that we are about innovation. We are about technology. We are about making the world a better place. A few years ago, a group of really wealthy Chinese investors came to Israel. They're the guys who built the Shanghai Towers. Look them up. They're called the Sinochem Corporation. They came with their CEO and their top 20 executives to Israel on a two-week fact-finding mission. What is the secret of the Jews? They went from company to company all around the country. And then they got to me. I told them exactly the same story I just told you. But they don't want to hear that. They don't want to know about rabbis, cheeseburgers, surfing. What? They want to know what makes a mobile eye. So I said, look, you want to know what makes a mobile eye? Fine. The CEO at his last company dinner said, everyone's asking me this question. So I'll tell you, he said, a lot of stars need to line up. You need to have a novel idea, something people didn't think could be done, detecting 3D objects in 3D space with a single camera. You need to be able to roll with the financial punches. That story I told you that we were out of money, that's like one of 10 stories where Mobileye was this close to bankruptcy. And we figured out, we'll get a loan, we'll get another investment, we'll cut some corners here. You have to be able to figure out how to keep the finances running. You have to have stamina. You have to be able to understand you're not gonna have an exit in two years or five years or 10 years. Mobileye went public on the New York Stock Exchange after 14 years, and another three years later, we were bought out by Intel for a total of 17 years before that exit. In that time, you can't keep saying, two years, two years? No, you have to sit down and work, and the exit will come when the exit will come. Um, you need to be able to pivot, change directions. You're making ACC, you're making ADIS, you're making autonomous vehicles. And finally, he said, I like to quote Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson said, I believe in luck. And I believe the harder you work, the more luck you have. So I looked at these Chinese investors and I said, listen, um, you know, I'm a rabbi, so I like to change that a little bit. I believe that there's a creator. He wants us to fix the world. I believe that if we do his will, he will help us do his will. We will have the help of heaven the harder we work at it. So right when I said that, um, the Israeli tour guide that was bringing around this Chinese investor group came running up to me. And he whispered in my ear and he said, drop the God stuff. They're total atheists. So what do you say to that? So I said, uh, I heard you're atheists. So they smiled. They nodded their heads. So I said, okay, 
Let me just leave you with a little enigma, a question, a problem that doesn't have such an easy answer. It's called the Jewish people. The Jewish people have been living in the land of Israel, and the Romans came 2,000 years ago, and they kicked us out. They spread us out all over the globe. Wherever we went, they didn't like us very much. As a matter of fact, wherever we went, they tried to kill us. And they're still trying. But we'll survive because we have always survived. Not only did we survive, we came back to our land, we rebuilt our country, and we're so successful that there are groups from all over the world coming to find out what's our secret. How do you explain that? You realize non-Jews have written about us. Mark Twain famously wrote, everything is mortal but the Jew. What is the secret of his immortality? So I looked at these Chinese investors and I said, how do you explain that? Some people call it luck. I call it the help of heaven. Muchas gracias.